Yeah. Great. All right, we're, we're ready to get started for the uh, sessions entitled uh, Genomics, Religion, and Communication, Traversing Perspectives, Vocabularies, and, and Findings. If we could get started, we're, we're trying to uh, try to stay on the schedule since some people have flights. And I will be, I'll be moderating this session. Um, each speaker will have about 20 minutes to speak. We'll stop for 10 or so minutes for questions after each, after each presentation. Um, it's Rebecca Ray Anderson. Thank you. I'll be talking today about prenatal genetic counseling in particular, and as we've heard recently, prenatal genetics kind of consolidates all of those issues so, such that life's major questions show up on stage all at the same time. And I think that the role of the genetic counselor is to act as stage manager so that patients can accommodate these questions and answer them in a way that makes sense. Officially, the short-term goals of genetic counseling are to help families understand the facts consider all the legally and medically reasonable management options, and make decisions that are consonant with their personal goals and values. So I don't call this value-free or value-neutral. I call it patient-valued. Uh, the non-directive part of that is simply that we ought to lay out everything that's reasonably on the menu and guide the patient to make the decisions that make sense for them. Now, general, generally, genetic counselors are trained in a cognitive behavioral approach to counseling so that we emphasize a personal locus of control and we model affirmative imagery so that we think it's better to see yourself as an actor than acted upon, better to see yourself as a survivor than a victim, better to choose and own your choice. And it's really up to the counselor to delineate all those medically appropriate, legally available management options. That's partly because otherwise the family won't know what they are. And the counselor should also be alert to comments that might signal misunderstanding or a potential for poor adjustment and offer a reframe, an alternate perspective that might make the journey smoother. Years ago, I met with a woman who had undergone an early induction of labor in a pregnancy with trisomy 18. That's a chromosomal disorder that generally causes death by three months of age. Uh, this picture is of a baby who was born live and, and expired in a couple of hours. And my patient said, explaining her induction, I couldn't have handled it. It would have driven me crazy. I would have become suicidal. So my little behavioral cognitive approach kicked in, and I thought, this over the long term, this message could translate into I'm weak, I'm selfish, I'm a bad mother. So I offered this kind of alternative notion of, you know, most of us are stronger than we think we are, and I suspect that had you continued this pregnancy, you would have risen to the occasion and done what you needed to do. And she very flatly said, I would have driven me crazy, I couldn't have done it, I would have been suicidal. So I went on. Now this patient was Jewish, and I knew she was Jewish, but what I didn't know at the time was that there is no accommodation in Jewish law for terminating pregnancy for a fetal anomaly. The only acceptable reason to end a pregnancy is on the basis of maternal anguish and threat to her physical or mental health. So her conception of her reasoning was the right conception for her. And my reframe was completely wrong. So when I learned this, I began to wonder how many other belief patterns I was trampling on without knowing it. And I undertook a study that was sponsored by the Jane Engelberg Memorial Foundation. And I asked 89 US religious denominations to answer a survey about spiritual questions relating to prenatal genetic counseling. I started with the denominations claiming at least 200,000 members or those with at least 50 congregations. And I don't think that even brought me to 50 total. So I added a bunch to reflect minority faith traditions. And ultimately, I got responses from 31 denominations. And unfortunately, most of them were Judeo-Christian, but uh, we'll go forward from there. I compiled these into a reference book so that other health providers could have the same kind of background information I was lacking about what some of the traditions might be saying relating to prenatal genetics and, and the spiritual issues involving them. 
So I'm going to give you a lot of illustrations, and then at the very end I'm going to kind of come around and give you some caveats about how this information might be used or misused. The topics in general are organized to mirror the progress of a pregnancy. So the issues are treated in roughly the order in which they might arise. Ah, sorry. Okay. And soulment and personhood. Now, there have been a few theologians who spent some time on the notion that conception is a process spanning days to weeks, but the great majority of denominations identify fertilization as the signal event at which human life begins, and many also claim that this is the moment at which personhood or ensoulment is established, but others, quote, do not identify a time or stage at which the soul or spirit arrives, nor when personhood starts. That's Christian Reformed. In the Jewish tradition, the fetus is acknowledged as a potential life from conception. But there's a passage in the Talmud that refers to the fetus in the first 40 days as, as water or mere water, so some authorities find a lesser duty during that time to the fetus, and thereafter the fetus is considered like the thigh of its mother, part of the body deserving of the same care. Live birth signals the establishment of true personhood, However, traditionally in Judaism, a full burial was not accorded until 30 days after birth. Similarly, Akankar teaches that each spirit is soul, a divine and eternal spark of God, and that soul enters the physical body at or about the time of birth. According to the teachings of Christian science, each individual is eternally the image and likeness of God, which I take to mean before and after our physical presence on earth. Therefore, there is no single moment when an individual comes into being. And finally, the Presbyterian Church USA, in an attempt to embrace all convictions, has this to say. Presbyterians hold varying points of view about when human life begins. The five most common viewpoints are, one, at conception. Two, when the following criteria developed by Harvard Medical School are met. A, response to external stimuli. B, presence of deep reflex action. C, presence of spontaneous movement and respiratory effort. D, presence of brain activity ascertained by the electroencephalogram. Three, at quickening. Four, at viability. Five, at birth. Those holding these varying points of view agree, however, that after human life has begun, it is to be cherished and protected as a gift of God. Okay. Prenatal care. In several denominations, seeking prenatal care is, medically, uh, is, is religiously required. It's, it's uh, part of your stewardship of your body. And under Jewish laws, the body's owned by God, so you've got to uh, keep care of it. In some religions, issues of modesty will dictate changes in protocol. For instance, for an observant Orthodox Jew, uh, the woman will avoid being alone in a closed room with a man who isn't her husband. And providers should also try to uh, accommodate religious preferences around diets and holy days. But for virtually every religious obligation like that, medical necessity trumps religious observance. Although Christian scientists typically do not seek conventional medical care, they do usually engage a physician for mechanical assistance during childbirth. Typically, they would not use other interventions such as prenatal diagnosis and would expect to heal with prayer any events leading to the impression that either the mother or the fetus is imperiled. Some Orthodox authorities, both Christian and Jewish, discourage prenatal diagnosis as an inducement to abortion, and others judge its permissibility based on its potential to preserve life or recognize its potential to avert suffering. The Roman Catholic Evangelium Vitae says, when they do not involve disproportionate risks for the child or the mother and are meant to make possible early therapy or even to favor a serene and informed acceptance of the child not yet born, these techniques are morally licit. While recognizing the importance of genetic research which has as its goal the treatment of cure of genetic illness, the Southern Baptist Convention likewise voiced emphatic opposition to the use of prenatal genetic testing for the purpose of abortion decisions. Prenatal treatment, early delivery, and other fetal interventions. Um, typically interventions which do not involve disproportionate risk to the mother and which offer a reasonable likelihood of benefit to the fetus are allowed or sometimes required. Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese says that invasive, invasive fetal therapies such as blood or stem cell transplantation, gene therapy, or surgery are not permitted because of the uniqueness of the individual created in the likeness of God. 
In Dona Vida, the Roman Catholic Church says, a strictly therapeutic intervention whose explicit objective is the healing of various maladies, such as those stemming from chromosomal defects, will in principle be considered desirable, provided it is directed to the true promotion of the personal well-being of the individual without doing harm to his integrity or worsening his condition of life. Such an intervention would indeed fall within the logic of the Christian moral tradition. The Church of the Nazarene supports the use of genetic engineering to achieve gene therapy. We recognize that gene therapy can lead to preventing and curing disease and preventing and curing anatomical and mental disorders. We oppose any use of genetic engineering that promotes social injustice, etc. Similarly, the Seventh-day Adventists have issued actually two quite lengthy statements about the appropriate use of human gene therapy and Christian principles for genetic interventions and say that these should be based on harmony with the following biblical principles, alleviating suffering and preserving life, safety and protection from harm, honoring God's image, protecting human autonomy, and understanding God's creation. In contrast, the Evangelical Free Church of America states that Christians should refrain from and urge society to refrain from experimental efforts to modify the human genetic heritage by genetic engineering. Now, I presume you could interpret this to mean that somatic is okay and germline is not, but that's not made clear in the statement. Early delivery and therapeutic abortion, either for maternal or fetal indications, our next topic. Most denominations permit interruption of pregnancy to save the life of the mother and some to save the health of the mother. In some traditions, pregnancy interruption is required if the mother's life is threatened by continuing pregnancy, and this includes the Jewish traditions. Maimonides asserts that in the event of life-threatening pregnancy complications, a woman has a duty to save herself by aborting her fetus, just as she would have a duty to save herself from a pursuer who threatened her life. Other Talmudic passages clearly establish that the life and being of the mother is more highly valued than the potential life of the fetus. Thus, interruption of pregnancy or early delivery of a viable pregnancy, if possible, is required when necessary to save the life of the mother, and pregnancy interruption or early delivery is permitted when the woman's mental or physical health is threatened by the continuing pregnancy. In general, conservatives are less stringent than orthodox and reform less stringent than conservatives in their assessments of what constitutes a threat uh, to the life or health of the mother significant enough to uh, invoke those principles. Catholic doctrine expressly rejects this line of reasoning and says the one eliminated is a human being at the very beginning of life. No one more absolutely innocent could be imagined. In no way could this human being ever be considered an aggressor, much less an unjust aggressor. But the ERDs, the uh, uh, Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Health Care, say that operations, treatments, and medications that have as their direct purpose the cure of a proportionately serious pathological condition of a pregnant woman are permitted when they cannot be safely postponed until the unborn child is viable, even if they will result in the death of the child. Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, despite the progress of medical science, there are still unusual circumstances in which a mother will die if an abortion is not performed. There are also cases in which the danger to the mother's life is greatly increased if no abortion is performed. Even in such circumstances, a mother may choose to risk her own life as an act of love, but such an act of self-giving cannot be required. It must be freely given, not imposed. In many denominations, abortion as a response to fetal de defects is not permitted, flat out. I mean, we know when many of those are. Um, one example, Assemblies of God. When people set themselves up as God to determine if a life is worth living, whether before or after birth, they are rejecting the sovereignty of the creator of all things. God's ways are above man's ways. When Moses complained of his lack of eloquence, God said, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Others acknowledge that under certain conditions and after prayerful consideration, pregnancy interruption is acceptable. ECLA, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, there are circumstances of extreme fetal abnormality which will result in severe suffering and very early death of an infant. In such cases, after competent medical consultations, the parents may responsibly choose to terminate the pregnancy. Whether they choose to continue or to end such pregnancies, this church supports the parents with compassion, recognizing the struggle involved in the decision. 
and Episcopal Church resolved that this new ability to diagnose serious abnormalities in the fetus before birth is a welcome gift to reduce pain and sorrow in the parents and suffering in the newborn, but that abortion after the diagnosis of non-serious or trivial abnormalities or abortion in a case where purely cosmetic abnormalities are discovered is strongly condemned. Treatment of, oops, spiritual consequences. I'm off scale here. I'm going to have to wing it. Okay. Um, spiritual consequences of a therapeutic abortion in many cases, um, for instance, the Jewish, it's considered a fulfillment of a religious obligation to have an abortion if it's medically indicated. And in other traditions, the consequences may be excommunication or penance. For instance, the Christian Orthodox churches, the Catholic Church, would invite penance and prayer and contemplation. And when you have repented of that sin, you would be welcomed back into the congregation. I think part of the difficulty for some women under these circumstances is if you say you're going to repent, that means that had you had it to do over again, you would not do the same thing. And a lot of families would say, if I had this to do over again, I still would do the same thing. So the question would be whether in good faith you could actually state that you have repented. Many other congregations say that um, it's not for the congregation to judge the spiritual journey of one of its congregants and that uh, this person would be embraced and supported to the best of their ability. Okay, spiritual implications of birth defects. First, Christian Orthodox liturgy. Have mercy on thy handmaiden for the voluntary or involuntary sin she has committed that has caused the death and the miscarriage of the child that that she has conceived. Forgive her every sin, both voluntary and involuntary. In the abundance of thy compassion, speed the healing of her weakened body, for we were conceived in sin and iniquity, and each of us is impure in thy presence, O Lord. That's the traditional liturgy. Currently, people are working to change that so that the notion of inherent sin is still there, but the notion of maternal guilt and and, uh, responsibility is not. Um, Now the Antiochian Orthodox Church say that birth defects or atypical features, pregnancy loss, are not signs of unworthiness, sinfulness, or divine judgment against the parents, the infant, or the extended family. They do say that birth defects or atypical features could imply chosenness or favor by God, but not automatically. And um, in Ekankar, which is somewhat like Hinduism, uh, the central teaching is that human experience is governed by the law of karma, the spiritual law of cause and effect. Thus, individual souls have created their life today through their past actions. And Ekas views everyday experiences as gifts from God given to soul for its spiritual unfoldment. Let's go on a bit faster here. There are some religious traditions in which treatment of remains is dictated by the faith. If there are um, identifiably human remains in the Christian Orthodox and in the Jewish traditions, they should be buried by the family with with appropriate rites and not disposed by the hospital. Um, Rituals for imperiled offspring, I didn't find evidence in any church for prenatal baptism. I had heard rumors of this in the Catholic Church, but I didn't find anybody who actually endorsed it. Most advocate prayers, some anointing for oil, uh, with oil, um, some immediate baptism. And those who do ask for immediate baptism because of its spiritual consequences if it isn't there are the ones who also authorize baptism by lay people. So for instance, the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Christian Churches, and LCMS, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, all say that anyone with the proper intent can baptize. We believe in the necessity of baptism in the case of such children because of what God promises in this sacrament, eternal life in his presence. But the eternal destiny of an unbaptized child is a matter we must leave to God. In terms of medical interventions for newborns, most of these um, traditions advocate the same kind of treatment that you would give for anyone in terms of medically appropriate 
and most of the, the traditions would not require what they would call um, extraordinary means to maintain life. Uh, the ones who advocate faith healing have actually talked a little bit about um, what it means when somebody isn't healed after much prayer, and the usual conclusion is that it must not be part of God's intent right now. God is waiting for a time in which that healing will be made more dramatic or more appropriate. Every church authorizes adoption if needed when the family can't care for the child. And here's a note from the PCUSA. We realize that some families feel that giving a child up for adoption is a betrayal of family loyalty and is even against the will of God. But the Bible tells of a mother who, because she loves her child so deeply, volunteered to give it to another woman. It happened in King Solomon's day when he had to decide which of two women was the real mother of the baby. The real mother of the baby, Solomon decided, was the one who loved her child enough to give it away, if need be, in order to ensure its welfare. So lots of, uh, and I won't go into rituals after death because you can imagine that they vary quite a bit from church to church. Lots of differences in the approaches, lots of thought put into these statements, lots of potential value for people who are members of those denominational traditions. But we can't assume, number one, any more than anybody is a member of a, a specific denominational, tr denominational tradition or denominational uh, tr um, congregations are actually decreasing in numbers while our non-denominational non congregations are increasing. So people don't necessarily have that religious history that they used to have. And even if they are members of a particular faith tradition, it doesn't necessarily mean that they adhere to all of the beliefs of that faith tradition. As we know, about 80% of people who claim to be Catholics use oral contraceptives. Um, so I think the easiest thing and the most effective thing to do for a family is say, during a conversation, does this raise spiritual issues for you? And then listen to what they have to say. And I think it's important for the person who's counseling to raise that question themselves because usually the person in power sets the agenda. And unless you invite the conversation, the family may assume that it's something that you're not able to talk about or not willing to talk about. I work in a public institution. Some people actually think it's illegal for me to talk about traditions of faith because I'm working for the state. Uh, if you happen to be in a Catholic hospital or a Jewish hospital, somebody might assume that all you can talk about is Catholic or Jewish traditions. Not true. So if you have the conversation, if you listen, you provide the appropriate resources, and then finally offer grace to people. And I found this odd little um, passage in Babette's Feast by Isaac Dennison that I've actually used in a couple of family letters. We tremble before making our choice in life, and after having made it again, again tremble in fear of having chosen wrong. But the moment comes when our eyes are opened and we see and realize that grace is infinite. Grace, my friends, demands nothing from us but that we shall await it with confidence and acknowledge it in gratitude. See, that which we have chosen is given us and that which we have refused is also and at the same time given us. Questions from you? Yeah, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Well, this is actually a question. It's more a comment. I love your final thoughts. And the only thing I would add is that I think those same items should be given to oneself. Ah, nice. I mean, I, as a provider. Yeah. Say that again. Mm -hmm. Those same items should be. That these should be. Providers, providers should do the same thing for themselves. Ask themselves. Is this raising spiritual issues for me? Am I listening to what I'm hearing inside me? Are there resources that I need to work with this and offer myself grace? That's perfect. There, there is yeah. so much suffering among professionals, and we ignore it because we are so patient-focused. And, you know, it's like, we are they. It was, it's a wonderful presentation. I found myself hung up, though, on your, when you were talking about repentance and whether you would do it again. And uh, I just, this is a real question. I do sometimes find myself um, using the phrase, um, well, I have regrets but no second thoughts. 
That's to say I would, I would do it again, but there are things about it I regret. And I guess I'm just wondering if in order to repent, one has to go so far as to say, I wish I hadn't done it. I am assuming that, at least in the Catholic tradition, that would be required, that you, you reject your sin and you leave your sin behind. But perhaps I'm mistaken. I can actually read the portion of Evangelium Vitae that talks to women who have had abortions. Um, and it says, just give yourself over with humility and trust to repentance. So perhaps it doesn't require. The Father of Mercies is ready to give you his forgiveness and his peace in the sacrament of reconciliation. Um, and if that's true, then, yeah, maybe it's, it's a more hopeful thing than I thought. Um, but my, my fear was always that nobody could, who would really do it again if they had to make that awful choice would be able to say, um, gee, I wish I hadn't done this. James Sewell, a Methodist pastor, to repent means to turn 180 degrees away from your previous action. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a question about um, the idea of personhood. Sorry, I had a question about the idea of personhood. Um, if we look at how um, prenatal care is done in hospitals, if a woman goes in, there's not a legal distinction of personhood at that time because there's only one patient chart for the mother. So I guess if the idea of personhood is integrated, there would technically be a patient sheet for the child as well. And I just wondered, um, I, I had a lecturer come talk to my class about um, new surgical techniques for spina bifida that involved um, surgery while the woman was pregnant with the child. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that and whether this interfered with like religious notions of personhood. In the medical field, whenever you have a pregnant person, you realize that you had two patients, even though only one has a chart. And I think that for most religious traditions, fetal surgery, if it's intended to benefit the fetus, would not violate uh, the notion of, of uh, doing good, with the exception of the Antiochian Orthodox, which says that that somehow fundamentally changes the image of God. I, I'm not quite sure why prenatal and postnatal would be different there. Um, the thing that I find interesting is the traditions that say that personhood be begins with conception traditionally do not offer funerals for miscarried babies and sometimes even not for stillbirths. For instance, the Greek Orthodox does not give a full burial to a stillborn baby because that person is not a full person yet. Uh, so I think it would vary by tradition, but I don't think that there's any um, notion in, in medicine that you don't have a, a strong obligation to the fetus in utero. Moderator has a question ah. or, or comment. Um, the question, does this raise spiritual issues for you? Uh, one of the things that I've struggled with is you cannot predict what people will associate with the word spiritual mm -hmm. or religion. And so I wonder if we could add, does this raise spiritual, religious, or deeply felt concerns for you? And it's kind of an acknowledgement of Larry's opening lecture as well to um, just open up the circle a little bit mm -hmm. wider. But would, would make sense. I think of religion as a subset of spiritual, but maybe not everybody does. Yes, I'd like to approach one thing you said. I come from a denominational background for many, many years and the past uh, seven years in a community church as a pastoral care pastor. And uh, one of the issues that you mentioned about the increased uh, number of community churches that are arising as opposed to some of the denominational churches, one of the things it poses is a greater issue, and that is most of the people, by far probably 90%, come from some denomination. Mm -hmm. And so therefore you have a greater mixture in relationship to previous held beliefs 
or current held beliefs based upon a denominational um, statement by, that you've read. So it becomes a greater issue, especially from my perspective in counseling, uh, from a pastoral standpoint, to know what those backgrounds are and how it impacts the questions that you have raised. The other interesting thing, I think, is um, that a lot of the pastors have never read these things. And, and it came as a surprise even to some of the denominational headquarters because they'd answer my survey. I'd go online and find these little excerpts, put them in the, the response, send them back for their approval, and they said, Where'd you find those? I didn't know. <laughs> so it's kind of intriguing that uh, what hap what's in the resolutions and in the books doesn't necessarily filter down to the congregational level. Another thing I'd, I'd want to kind of go back to, the very first question that I, I forgot to mention is my, my question, what's the most loving thing to do? is, I think, very useful in terms of getting families to think about their whole environment um, and not merely on the fetal issues because truly we're all embedded in our families. And so if, if you start with the presumption that the most loving choice is going to embrace everybody, I think it gives them a little more permission to, to look around and, and think of all of the long-term consequences of, of their decisions. Final thoughts? Misty Williams, I'm a genetic counselor here. Thank you so much for your talk and your resources, just so that you know, are, I think are being, well, I went to the University of Cincinnati and they were available in a binder for lots of other counselors and counseling students that have been really helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, did you ask about blessings or ceremonies for induced pregnancies that had a fetal indication. I did, and um, I, there were very few that responded. Uh, most said that naming was appropriate, that blessing was appropriate. Um, one of the responses said, I'm not really sure what to do about an aborted fetus because of the issue of choice, but in all other cases we would do thus and such. Um, Denominations have different approaches about baptism because baptism signifies an intention to raise a child in the church in some traditions and in, in signifies an intention to dedicate to God and others. Or, uh, you know, Baptists don't get baptized until they're of the age of reason. So you really need to ask the family what their heritage is there and ask what their spiritual advisor um, advises under those circumstances. And the other thing that I think is a little... Um, worrisome is we now in many hospitals have protocols for pregnancy loss where you take a little snip of hair and you take a photograph, you take the baby's footprint. For an Orthodox Jew that would probably not be welcome. Matter of fact, I'm sure it would not be welcome because you'd be taking something from the body that needs to stay with the body. So. Actually, we'll probably have a little time at the, at the end to bring Professor Anderson back up. So, okay. if you, But let's go ahead and um, have Mary White give her a talk. Thanks. How do I get mine up here? Hey, Joe, how do I, how do, I do this? Well, this is the home stretch. I'll try to be fast. Um, I want to thank Rebecca for setting up this talk really nicely. You gave a wonderful introduction to the range of spiritual and religious values that, that show, show up in genetic counseling, as well as a nice overview of what you try to do in genetic counseling. And you also mentioned that, that engaging in these kinds of conversations is not particularly easy for many genetic counselors. And for that reason, I'm going to take a practical look at how and why genetic counselors might try to integrate religious and spiritual values into their genetic counseling sessions. Now, my disclaimer is that I'm not a genetic counselor, um, nor am I a theologian, 
Um, but I've been a respectful friend of genetic counseling for a long time and been watching and thinking about what they do for many years. And I trust that the genetic counselors here will straighten me out at the end of this. Please do. Um, how do I make this go forward? Oh, oh, there we go. Um, here's my outline. I'm going to begin by reviewing why genetic information is conceptually problematic. I'll follow this with a summary of some of the factors involved in risk interpretation. I'll then explain and explore why and how religious and spiritual beliefs might contribute to genetic risk perception and discuss some of the barriers to conducting what is called spiritual assessments. That's a term not everyone is happy with, but um, bear with me today. I'm going to conclude with a recommendation for genetic counselors. My goal is to outline a succinct, reasoned and bounded line of inquiry for counselors that offers an appropriate and user-friendly way for them to address their clients' spiritual and religious concerns. I'll begin with, why is genetic information conceptually problematic? Now, the main reason for this, for their clients, is that genetics is very complicated, especially if it's unfamiliar. But here I want to focus on the fact that risk assessments are usually given in terms of numerical probabilities such that decisions are based on uncertain, not definitive information. This uncertainty is highly problematic because its probabilistic and prophetic dimensions demand our attention, but they deny us confidence in our judgments and decisions. This uncertainty is the starting point for my discussion today. Now, it's long been known that probabilities and risks are difficult for humans to mentally grasp and work with. Reasons suggested for this have been attributed to human evolutionary needs, as well as how the brain manages mathematical quantities and calculations. But in general, I want to propose that risk is understood as the possibility of a loss. The significance of the risk depends on how a person perceives the magnitude of the potential loss, as well as the likelihood that the loss will occur. Because individuals differ over what they consider a loss, the significance of that loss, and its likelihood, the risk has little or no objective value. It becomes meaningful only when it's interpreted. Now, genetic risks are particularly abstract. In much of medicine, when a risk is conveyed, there's medical data of some kind to support it, symptoms, lab results, imaging, something tangible. But genetic risks may not be accompanied by any concrete evidence of a problem. Because these risks are so abstract, most people then have to work kind of hard to find them meaningful. They do this by making associations between different kinds of concerns and that numerical risk. A lot of studies have been done on the factors that contribute to risk perception. In general, when the risks are high, though, that, that factor, the magnitude of that risk, overwhelms most other factors. But when risks are somewhat lower or, or, or less clear, other contributing factors include genetic and family history, past experiences, all these things. Um, but in addition, there are many other contributing factors to risk interpretation. These include contextual factors, such as framing effects, that have, uh, framing effects can heighten or diminish perceptions of risk, um, and these depend on how the risk is presented numerically. There are a number of ways to do that. Um, what else is discussed in counseling, what other risks the clients are dealing with, and other factors. Personality can make a difference. A person's general sense of optimism, confidence in luck, belief that it won't happen to me, or their anxiety level can exacerbate or diminish perceptions of risks. Fear can be a powerful emotional factor. There's a rational form of fear we call prudence, which we accept. Less rational forms of fear have to do with notions of dread or feelings of dread or, or fear of, of the unknown, which are experienced more vis viscerally. They're very hard to shake, and they're not entirely what we call rational. Fears can also be overblown or underestimated, depending on a person's experience and personality. Illness representations refer to how people think about an illness, its identity, its cause, duration, consequences, and controllability. These ideas evolve over time and are highly influenced by personal experience with disease, socio-cultural images of that disease, education, the media, and social modeling. Importantly, various cognitive strategies may also be used to cope with risks. One simple approach um, is to translate a risk into binary form. 
to construe it simply as either high or low or as something that will or will not happen. In addition, some people imagine best and worst case scenarios and sort of play their emotions off these scenarios and look for, for guidance from their emotional feedback. And some use heuristics, or what I call sh mental shortcuts, as a way of finding meaning in their risks. Heuristics work by drawing on a person's prior experience, knowledge, and emotions in predictable ways. Um, I'll touch on four commonly known heuristics in, in genetics here. Representativeness refers to over-reliance on limited experience, neglecting a possible range of variation in populations. For example, someone who has just received a diagnosis of some kind of cancer might think of a, an acquaintance who has had that kind of cancer and assume that their experience will be similar to that friend or acquaintance. That's neglecting a whole range of experience and can be very misleading. Availability has to do with the tendency to judge the likelihood of an event by the vividness, vividness with which an impression of that event comes to mind. Um, you've just seen the movie Jaws, you go to the beach in Florida, you think you're going to be eaten by a shark, right? Um, that kind of thing. But it does explain why a person who has a family member or friend with disease often has a heightened perception of his or her own risk. Anchoring refers to a person's baseline knowledge about a risk, which also can be difficult to shake, especially if it's been long-standing. I've just learned that eggs are not bad for us. It's going to be a long time before I can eat them, you know, happily. But take a Huntington's disease person at risk for Huntington's disease, who has carried the certainty they're going to develop that disease for many years. In their adult life, they get tested, they're found negative. Adapting to the fact that they're not going to get that disease can be very, very difficult. And some believe that through certain behaviors like diet or prayer, they can moderate a risk. In this way, they adopt a heuristic known as illusion of control. So these are just a few possible heuristics that can contribute to risk interpretation. But they show how an individual's limited experience, knowledge, and emotion and can help them make meaning of a risk in the face of uncertainty. Because heuristics are highly subjective, they're sometimes seriously misleading. But most people, despite this, are very confident of their ability to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. This, too, is a cognitive bias known as overconfidence. And there are many other cognitive biases like this that can impact risk interpretation. So just to summarize, the interpretations of risks and probabilities is subject to a broad range of contextual, cognitive, emotional, and social factors, not all of which are used in strictly rational ways. What's not yet clear is whether and how religious and spiritual beliefs may also have a contributing role. So to date, there's been relatively little research that examines the impact of religious and spiritual values in genetic risk perception. There's plenty on health in general, but in genetics, it's, it's, I haven't found a lot of studies. The ones that I have found provide inconsistent, often contradictory results, primarily illustrating that individuals and groups vary considerably in their, their use of religious and, religion and spirituality in their response to risks. A general weakness of the studies, as has been already discussed, is the crude measures of religion and spirituality employed that, that fail to specifically define which characteristics of religion or spirituality are being assessed. Generally speaking of the studies I've found, high risks um, generally outweigh religious factors in decision making, but when risks, risks are lower, religious and spiritual values may play a greater role. They may also play a, a, great, uh, a role in coping with risks. The Vanderbilt focus groups I found uh, actually more valuable than the studies I've found in illustrating a range of ways that, that religious and spiritual values can contribute. Um, in these focus groups, people spoke of life is a gift from God, that God has his purposes, of praying that they may do God's will, that tragedy can be a blessing, that God is in charge and the source of their meaning, that genetic disease may be a consequence of inadequate faith or past sin, of praying that God will provide a miracle, of, and of stating that God won't give me more than I can bear. The studies we heard from yesterday also support these kinds of approaches. Now, these data are limited but they do suggest that at least for some people, religious and spiritual beliefs may help to frame their risk perceptions and perhaps contribute to how clients see their options. Yet religion and spirituality are rare, rarely considered a standard element of genetic counseling. As Rebecca mentioned, many genetic counselors seem to be reluctant to explore these issues in their, set, in their sessions. 
um, some of the barriers to, to this reluctance have been identified and have been found to include a lack of time, thinking it would make the client uncomfortable, lack of training in conducting spiritual assessments, not knowing what to do with the information, ambivalence over the value of the information, concern that counselors' spiritual or religious values might conflict with those of clients, and just straight discomfort discussing spirituality. These reasons legitimately point to the time pressures felt across medicine today. Lacking clear reasons for doing so, counselors may worry that opening up discussions to religious and spiritual concerns may lead in unknown directions that could take time, make clients or themselves uncomfortable, or lead to issues counselors don't know how to deal with. In such cases, it just may be morally easier for counselors not to inquire and not to know too much about what their clients are thinking or choosing. Another reason for the discomfort may be due to our lack of a common language by which we can reconcile and integrate claims of faith with claims of reason. To a science or scientist or genetic counselor, faith claims may seem irrational. To a faithful patient, the truths provided by science may seem of lesser importance. Whether a worldview is governed by faith, reason, or both simultaneously will impact what it means for them to be responsible or to make responsible decisions. Again, it may be morally and professionally easier not to get too close to these kinds of questions or judgments. And as I mentioned in my comment, today we also cannot discount the posturing and especially the divisiveness that's become associated with religion in the last, I'll say, eight years. As some clergy have become increasingly involved in public life and public officials have claimed religious values as authoritative, some health professionals now also feel it's their right and responsibility to explore their patients' spiritual beliefs and to integrate their own religious values with the care they provide. Thank you, Chuck, for that good analysis there, the problems with this. This is an assumption made on the part of healthcare providers that is sometimes welcome, especially in Ohio where I am, where patients actually appreciate care providers who occasionally pray with them, but sometimes it's not welcome. At the opposite end of the spectrum, as Scale Geller has mentioned, some people feel that any mention of religion with patients is exploitive and professionally inappropriate. And for some counselors, admitting their religious and, and, and spiritual orientations in the workplace can be hazardous. So depending on the institution or perhaps its location, the political sensitivity of religious discussions may further discourage some counselors from exploring religious or spiritual issues, even when they're raised by clients. So where does that leave us? How might spiritual and religious concerns be successfully integrated into genetic counseling? And I want to suggest that the greatest barrier of all is simply a lack of clarity over what's appropriate for counselors to inquire about. Which aspects of religion and spirituality matter? Now, here I, I list a number of uh, attributes of religion that you find in, in the now legions of spiritual assessment tools that have been developed. And they refer to religion as a social institution, as a set of doctrinal beliefs, a particular liturgical style, all these things, adherence to specific religious texts or rituals, individual religious practices such as prayer or church attendance, um, personal spiritual frameworks, new age beliefs, religious and spiritual experiences approached through aesthetic or sensory appreciation, and spiritual states reached through meditation, fasting, silence, isolation, or other means, I don't know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. There are lots of ways of getting to a, a, a state of ecstasy. Now, not all of these are in every spiritual assessment tool, but they're all um, potential candidates. Um, you also find um, diverse uses of faith for existential meaning, for support in times of crisis, explanation and ethical guidance, or as sources of community, hope, forgiveness, inner peace, or love. Oh, I'm sorry. You also find um, diverse sources of religious and spiritual authority, whether that authority is claimed to lie in sacred text, religious traditions and teachings, particular religious representatives, or ourselves, corresponding to our personal beliefs. So again, of these varied attributes of religion, which matter in genetic counseling. Now, consider that religious doctrines, beliefs, traditions, and practices are the result of human intention, having evolved over time to address certain fundamental questions, 
how the world came to be, why we live, suffer, and die, and to give meaning and ethical orientation to our experience as social interdependent beings. These beliefs have clear uses. We yearn for them. We hunger for them. Cultures worldwide find variations on how they answer these questions. Religion and spirituality are not arbitrarily chosen. We need them. They serve especially to support us in periods of uncertainty, those times in life that defy explanations such as reproductive, reproduction and childbirth, serious illness and death. In the face of genetic risks, which are unfamiliar, uncertain, and beyond our control, it's understandable, oh crap, <laughs> that people of faith should turn to their ultimate sources of knowledge and power for explanation, guidance, or perhaps a way out. But what happens then? How does faith help? Now, as I stated at the outset, the probabilistic nature of genetic information is conceptually challenging, causing stress and demanding interpretation before action can be taken. We've seen that this interpretation draws on a variety of factors, both rational and non-rational. It also seems that for some people, religious and spiritual faith provide a kind of meaning and guidance, whether in the form of assurance, confidence, or optimism that God will provide. Well, these other things. You've got the slide. <laughs> um, some of the different sources of comfort or explanation may be that God, God's ways are inscrutable, but his mercy, his mercy is just. God will not ask for more than one can give. Disease as the consequence of a spiritual shortcoming or past misdeed. Suffering may have its purposes, whether to inspire hope, faith, repentance, or redemption. And Rebecca has shown us that there are legion more ways that, that, that um, explanation can be provided. In short, um, and I, I, I noted down here, I love the street sign yesterday. Just add that in. Religious and spiritual beliefs may provide coping mechanisms, meaning, and in some cases, in clear, clear guidance. In these ways, they serve essentially as another heuristic framework. That's what Larry quoted me on yesterday. As a way that to give shape to what is otherwise unintelligible. We can use our beliefs in this way. Now here, I'm not making any claims about the nature or reality of God. I am not turning God into a heuristic, for if it looks like I am. I'm just saying that our ideas about God and our ideas are all we have may work in a similar way to a heuristic in this context. Now, understanding religious and spiritual values as a heuristic suggests a limited approach for genetic counselors. That is, that in the course of their usual inquiry, they can ask one more question, as Rebecca has gotten close to, are clients aware of any religious and spiritual values or beliefs that might help them understand, accept, cope with, or respond to their risks and circumstances? The goal of this question is for clients to explore how the religious and spiritual beliefs might contribute to their interpretive and decision-making processes and whether they feel those influences are authentic, reasonable, and beneficial. That is all genetic counselors need to do. They don't need to be concerned with a full range of clients' beliefs, the strength of their spiritual communities, their daily spiritual rituals, their personal relationship with God, or any of the other host of things that typical spiritual assessment tools get into. The counselor's role is bounded. She is only to focus on the ways in which their values, spiritual values, may play a part in their risk interpretation and decision making, the goal being for the counselor to get at the best decision they can. That said, exploring this question will not be easy, and the counselors know full well why. Some clients may not know why the question is important. They won't know how to respond. They may have difficulty articulating their beliefs. Um, and some may have, most problematically, beliefs or communities of faith that seem limiting, perhaps even damaging to the client's self-esteem, autonomy, or mental or physical health. This could be when an illness is seen as a test or a form of punishment, when failure to heal is considered evidence of insufficient faith, when suffering is defended or explained as a way of imitating Christ. This is particularly problematic if that comes not from the client but from their church authority, their pastor or priest. Other um, beliefs may inhibit the client from considering certain medical choices, um, such as faith that God will provide a miracle may suggest that they don't need chemotherapy, um, that, faith, that prayer will heal or that suffering is redemptive. These are very difficult situations for which there is no counseling blueprint. And I need to say also that counselors need to be aware that um, religious beliefs may serve as necessary defenses and that to question them they may do more harm than good and they also need to be aware of when to refer. 
whether to pastoral or psychological counseling, long-term counseling is rarely the, the genetic counselor's job. So my conclusion, I began today by acknowledging the cognitive challenges posed by genetic uncertainty. I suggested that people can rarely make sense of a numerical risk without resorting to some sort of interpretive framework. In the context of genetic counseling, I recommended that religious and spiritual values be seen as functioning essentially as a heuristic that assists clients in understanding and responding to uncertainty. And I proposed that in genetic counseling, discussion of religious and spiritual value be limited just to that, how they impact risk perception. This limited approach, however, is not without challenges, particularly when clients' religious and spiritual values may lead to harmful decisions or at odds with counselors' own beliefs. Such situations will cause a certain amount of moral distress and raise old questions. What are the limits of non-directiveness? How should counselors respond if a client's faith seems likely to cause harm? And can a decision be responsible if it's based on non-rational factors, such as religious or spiritual values? The answers to these questions will require a determined effort to broaden our understanding of both science and religion. The path forward requires that our clergy and seminarians sincerely commit to scientific and genomic literacy, literacy and that our scientists and medical personnel equally seek to understand the kinds of meaning and value that are imparted through religious and spiritual faith. This exploration will require a certain kind of courage and openness to revising long-held assumptions. This conference has been an excellent start to this conversation, and I just want to thank Larry, Ellen, and Joe, and all of you for your contributions during this time. Thanks. Do we have time for some questions? It's not fair. <laughs> Why do you want to limit the conversation to the two things you I specified on not this slide, but one or two slides before. The but I want to limit the, it? The, yeah, the religious factors, the, the religious things that can be talked about. You wanted, you put. Bounce on it? Yeah. Because I'm really practical. Going farther than that will take a lot of time. Um, I don't think we can expect genetic counselors to get full training in, in the kinds of religious um, breadth that Rebecca has. Even and if the client wants even if the client wants to do it? Oh, I think you follow the client. Uh, I wouldn't have any problem with that if the counselor's comfortable doing that, but I don't think that they need to feel that's part of their job. Fair? I, I ha also have a question about the, um, the limitations, um, or putting it positively. Um, are you suggesting explicitly that the uncertainty should be discussed in the context of whatever the client's religious or spiritual framework is. I'm not sure I understand the question, that the uncertainty should be discussed. I don't know that you can avoid it. Well, you, you can talk in a prenatal diet. I'm not a genetics counselor either, but okay. I assume that in the context of talking about whether or not to have an abortion, the question of what the client's religious convictions about that are should come up and often does, but not on the question of the uncertainty of the diagnosis. And that seems to me to be a really interesting challenge to think about for people of faith. Is that what you meant? Well, actually, it's curious because I hadn't actually gone to the, the abortion discussion in my thinking. I was, I was thinking more about pre-testing decisions and how you interpret the, the, the diagnosis. My impression from conversations with counselors is often that they're not involved in that discussion so much. They might have an initial conversation, but that a lot of times 
clients go and get their pregnancy terminations elsewhere, they generally do, but the counselor may not even be aware of what they plan to do. Okay, so it was the uncertainty, the diagnostic Yeah, uncertainty. I was focusing on diagnostic uncertainty. I just wanted to clarify if that Sure, was. thank you. In the prenatal setting, when we talk about the tests that we're going to offer, I always talk about what are you going to do with that information? What, what are the benefits and limitations to that test for you? And that's typically when the conversation comes up. Great. And how do you handle it? Um, do you have, a, do you have a, an answer for Dr. Cowan that I, I um, did not? I mean, it, it really, you, usually you, you end up with, and, and typically, so... I don't want to stereotype my, the families that I talk with, but most people usually have a knee-jerk response to that based on their experiences, based on their religious experiences. Um, and then there's always sometimes a dichotomy between what the, the mother wants and then what her partner wants. And I try to have that conversation between them and listen to what they're saying and respond back to what each of the, the partners are saying so that they have a conversation together. And for the most part, I think we end up with some type of, or they, they end up with a better sense of what they would like to do as a family from that. But it's extremely, it's very unique, and, um, and you don't always have those in-depth conversations that, that are useful, but I, I think just having those conversations, or I mean, just posing that question is very useful for the families, because it's not something... And I get lots of conversations where they say, well, we've never talked about that. And we do, right there. We have that conversation. Um, and I just think that the listening and, and talking about that idea right then and there is very useful. Well, I think one of the most important things that counselors can do is invite consideration of a range of, of, of topics, which, which you do in, in what you just described and, and can be done by inviting this question, do you have religious or spiritual values that are significant here? Um, because without that invitation, there is a tendency always in the healthcare setting to focus on the medical. I am Jacob from Tokyo. I, I just would like to add one thing. I, I see a lot of patients who had previous miscarriages, and then I um, I, I often talk about chromosome stuff, but at the same time, I also do a little bit of grief counseling to them. And then, then I have to ask them, I, I feel I, I often ask them like how they have dealt with the, the fact of the pregnancy loss, and then I just go through the religious thoughts and spiritual. Want a response? Um, that makes sense. <laughs> Not all the time, but I had um, a couple of difficult experiences where, because I think I'm pretty much good at um, giving them a positive regard, whatever their beliefs are. Then, um, because they thought that I'm so good at understanding what they're believing in, um, they started um, inviting me into their religious groups. Wonderful. <laughs> it's exciting. And I just didn't know how to, you know, say no, because as a counselor in a session, I needed to be, I need to give, like, unconditional positive regard. Yeah. But at the same time, as a, like, a person, individual, I don't want to go into that religious group. So. So it seemed that you had to sort of buy into it if you went you had to agree yeah, with Yeah, well, it. they started sending, actually, one, one of them is a leader of a support group. So she's a very strong mother of a baby on, with a on disability. And she started sending me a lot of whole packets of the videotapes and textbooks of the, the particular, almost like a cult kind of religious group. And I just, uh -huh. but because she's a leader of the, the support group, so I cannot, you know, on stop having relationship with her you know, to, as a professional. And then it was so difficult for me to deal with that. So, 
I, like a yeah, new area where absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I just suddenly do this at your own risk. You yeah. don't know what you could, yeah. un, you know. <laughs> Thank you. As someone who's very interested in uncertainty, Mary, I really appreciate your talk. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, it's really, your arguments are some of the reason we came up with the hypothesis that we did, that people who are adhere to a religious framework are more likely to be able to deal with uncertainty. Um, and so that's why we were very surprised not to find that relationship, at least among professionals. So I'm, I'm curious to know if you think these sort of heuristics play out differently uh, on, depending on what side of the table you're sitting. Um, this is theoretical work. I have no data. Well, there is some data on the role of heuristics, absolutely. But when, I, when, I, when I'm sort of rolling religious values into that kind of framework, um, this, is, this is my putting this together. So I don't know if that helps. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Anderson back up, and we can have a, you know, at least five to seven minutes more questions. So I have a question, and <clears throat> the, I, have the, I have these moments where I have these odd questions, and I kind of mull them over for a while, and I see if they stand up, and this is one of those odd questions, because I was thinking about the, the uncertainty, and I was thinking about raising the kinds of issues that are both implicit and explicit in uh, your talk. And then th this is what struck me. So if you're a genetics counselor and you invite people to think about their spirituality or their values, and what they're looking for is advice on what is <clears throat> remarkably framed as a medical problem or a, a set of medical options. I'm thinking about the accountability or the responsibility for the sort of questions that you are asking them to think about in a healthcare system where they're maybe not going to talk to the genetics counselor again. They're probably going to go talk to a high-risk OB who then may not be prepared to talk to them about the things that you've raised in a, in a professional context. So we've thought about this, so it, it looks like we do need to have some way to follow up or be accountable for the kinds of questions that we're encouraging them to think about. Well, in my paper, I have more qualifiers. That, that at least mention how this whole framework that I've suggested um, does make some assumptions about what the appropriate role of genetic counseling is, as well as religious authority is in healthcare. And I think you're speaking to that. Um, there's a lot of, been a lot of debate over the appropriate, who am I to be saying this? We have all these counselors here. But <laughs> um, the non-directiveness uh, mandate of genetic counseling for years has been construed quite narrowly as give information and the, and the patient brings their own values and goals to the, to the table and, and the counselor provides the facts, they provide the values and decisions are made. Um, I have, in my career as a bioethicist, taken the stance that counselors need worry less about co coercing their clients through the kinds of discussions they have than worrying more about ensuring that their clients are capable or invited to make the best possible decision they can with as many different factors considered as they can. Meaning that I have encouraged that counselors feel free to, to raise questions that clients might not think of on their own. Can I, can I follow up? See, I also, in general, endorse that idea. 
I mean, I want things to be more explicit. I want conversations to be more detailed. The issue is the responsibility that the question prompter bears for the kinds of questions that will result, and that's part of the uncertainty. I agree. I think every care provider should be prepared to listen when somebody raises spiritual issues, and I think that's why we have chaplaincy programs in most hospitals, is when a person needs follow-up and the primary care provider is not able to give it, the chaplain steps in or you find a local spiritual advisor who can do that or you refer to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, because you raise the question, I don't think that you're then obligated to solve the question. Um, but you are probably obligated to help them find somebody to, to walk with them on the journey. May, may I just respond one more thing? You get to the point of can asking these questions um, perhaps challenge a necessary defense that I touched on very briefly? And, and I think that's a very important question. If the way you raise an issue or what you're dealing with um, removes something that the client has, has needed and you are causing harm, you need to take responsibility for that. And, right. and counselors... You don't know that, you don't know that at the Short term, yeah. Yeah, it's, that, that's a tricky one. That's a really tricky one. I just want to say that there is, just the way before we sort of dumped on Far Curlin and, and that whole literature, there is actually a whole literature. I believe uh, a man named Richard Strauss at Columbia University has published a number of papers exactly on your point, arguing that healthcare professionals have absolutely no business entering the world of, of religion and spirituality with their patients because they're not prepared to, to, to take responsibility for what ensues. Right, and, he, and he's saying you can't become prepared. It's not your job, it's someone else's job. So th there is debate in the sure. bioethics literature about this. Um, in regard to your conversation about the different religion and the different cultural elements, I think one thing that's important to remember as professionals in the medical community is that this may be that woman's only pregnancy experience and in her religious culture, in her personal culture, the experience of pregnancy may be important in and of itself, regardless of the outcome. Because in many religious cultures, the concept of the woman's pregnancy is, is so much a part of the maturity concept of that person having a place in the church and that person having a place in the life of the community, regardless of what the outcome may be. And I think the difficulty with the medical community taking hold of that is the fact that it is perhaps her only experience. Um, death for the medical person is a failure. Death in her book might not be. The fact of the process might have been what she had always been looking forward to to at least have the opportunity of the process. And in regard to his last statement, I think one thing that the medical community could do is look more into the different cultural elements. Um, one thing, I, I've done a lot of work with internationals, and one thing that really impressed me was there's a community over in Africa where their cultural religious belief is that the soul comes from God and returns to God and can come back. So if they have a baby who, for whatever reason, does not survive, either is born stillborn or immediately dies, the whole village dresses in white, and they have a ceremony of lifting that soul back to God and looking forward to the next child who will be born who will bear that soul back to earth. I think that's one thing that doctors need to look into is the process of being willing to catch a dead baby and what to do with it and helping a family find some expression that will meet their needs as far as dealing with that circumstance. Mm -hmm. That was one of the, the elements that I didn't have a lot of time to cover, the appropriate rituals 
surrounding newborn death. And I agree that, that it's very appropriate to ask. One of my favorite physicians says, death is not failure. Dying uncared for is failure. Thank you both for great talks and good questions. Thank you. We'll take a, uh, a quick break and come back at 11.45. Uh, I just want to remind you again that um, we really want feedback on the conference, so please. Um, all right, we're, we're ready to get started for the, uh, the final session. In this session uh, titled, Where Do We Go From Here, or as, uh, as Professor Press said, Where Do We Go From Here, um, we are um, going to hear from Professor Nancy Press first, and then Professor Ellen Clayton next. They're going to share their observations about the, the conference. Um, and bring everything together perfectly in a, in a synthesis so that you understand everything. No. Yes. Okay. Actually, I think my disclaimers will be longer than my observations. So, um, first of all, after this morning's session, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the original Saturday Night Live programs, but I feel like Emily Latella, I want to say, never mind, you know. <laughs> before everything I'm about to present, because I do think that this morning was, um, was a move toward a real synthesis, and I think that that probably uh, exhibits the brilliance of Joe and Ellen and Larry and how they set up the papers. So um, I would consider this sort of a kind of the first part of this kind of a straw man leading to exactly where I think we're going to, which is a wonderful place. Um, also, I, I hope that you realize that this it was an impossible task. There's been an incredible richness of, of papers. Um, and Ellen and I, in fact, got so befuddled last night that we sort of looked at each other and decided to go each into our own corners. So neither one of us has a clue what the other one is going to say, which is, you know, an interesting when you're doing a joint wrap-up. Um, <laughs> so we will see, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I just hope to get some conversation started. Um, I also noticed that Mary and I both found the same PowerPoint, which I thought was vaguely somehow, doesn't that look like a star of Bethlehem or something? <laughs> that was good. Okay, so, um, and, and let me also say that I'm, I've, what I'm not going to do, and I'm sure that Ellen won't either, is try to reference or mention all the papers that were given. So I will be, uh, uh, there are a couple of people I want to refer back to, but basically I will be an equal opportunity in, in sliding all of the wonderful stuff that we heard and just try to, to talk at a 30,000 foot level. So um, I was very struck at the very beginning of the conference um, with, um, with Dr. Smith's um, discussion of the relationship between Christianity and health. And um, it probably resonates with a lot of the work I've done and a lot of the ways that I th feel about things without ever having thought of it in a Christian context. But the idea that Christians must affirm the value of health but should not think of health, including genetic health, as the highest life value, to me underlies um, a lot of potential tension in, in bringing together these topics that we want to bring together. Um, and I wanted to start to wonder if that, if that tension told us something. And I, I had a feeling at, at points yesterday of a reversible figure um, that was implicit in that statement about um, health being a value but not necessarily the highest value. Do we have a sort of figure and ground uh, reversibility in the types of scholars who are here and the types of work that they do? And so I, I wanted to play around a little bit with this the idea of attention or of a reversal of what is under the heading of what being a kind of organizational principle through which um, to look at, at all the talks, and I would say maybe more um, all the talks yesterday. Um, so the first, so there, there are two kind of rubrics that I thought I, I was seeing and, and that come right out of this view of how Christians and 
non-Christian health professionals or the scientists might, might see the world. So the first one is that religion and spirituality is the overarching rubric, and I think that that was there in a, in, in a lot of the talks that were given. Um, and Larry Churchill has said that the key work that SPA, spirituality and religion, does is to provide a framework for responding to the deepest and most perennial of human questions. Who am I? How can I find meaning and hope in suffering? How can I come to terms with death, the dealing with finitude? And how do I live faithfully? And I felt that there were a lot of talks that came under that rubric in one way or another. And what did, what, so what did those talks talk about? Um, I think that they talked about exploring and explicating in various nuanced ways. Um, the degree of, of agreement and contestation that exists in just within Christian faith traditions. And I think that's a really um, important point and in terms of, do, of empirical work. Um, it, it opened up a richness, I think, to, uh, to those of us who don't work in, in these traditions uh, about just how difficult, sort of things that Gail was talking about, just how difficult it is to know what it is that we as empirical scientists are talking about when we start to talk about religiosity or spirituality or even something like Christian values. Um, people talked in, within this rubric talked about issues in genetics, um, but I felt mainly certainly yesterday at the edges of what is currently possible, uh, for example, genetic enhancement. Um, and things that are uh, potentially morally unacceptable. Again, uh, genetic enhancement and also, of course, the, the issues about the beginning of life and the end of life. Um, and there was also some discussion of a more general concern about the power of science to displace the human and, and the sacred. But I felt that what was notably missing was the clinic and the real experiences of doctors and patients, which is really not surprising when, when you have talks from moral philosophers, theologians, etc. But in terms of trying to bring these two fields together, um, I felt that there was great nuance on the one hand, but then it was, it was um, sort of far from the experience of the doctor, of doctor and patients. So the, the reversing the figure, the other rubric was that genetic, and, genetic science in medicine is the overarching rubric. And how did spirituality and religion function in the work of people who work more under the second rubric? So I think that some of the kinds of things, um, and it was certainly not all that was there, but some of the kinds of things that I think are the ways that empirical scientists, my, and this is you know my camp, myself included, are are used to doing is um, making religion another kind of sociodemographic variable, um, and in fact one that that often is seems to be. Um, um, elided in a way, uh, an assumption that it somewhat can be coterminous with culture or with race, ethnicity. Um, so the re religious beliefs of African Americans or the religious beliefs of, of some other group, which doesn't start out to be a religious group, but religion is one of the things that defines them. Um, religion was also seen to be a mediator or a moderator variable, helping individuals cope with uncertainty or the suffering of genetic risk and disease. Um, sometimes religion was seen to stand in the way or could, be, could come around and bend to the wisdom of potential health benefits. Um, and sometimes religion was seen to impede medical care or make communication with patients challenging. Um, so I felt that it was a more narrowed, um, uh, hollowed out perhaps view of religion. And the question that I, that I want to ask of that is how well is the SPAR paradigm served by, by, um, by the empirical studies we heard. And the data were uniformly fascinating. But Larry Churchill mentioned, suggested that if the questions we as empirical scientists um, study don't address those basic questions that religion um, is, is set up to serve, or, or does in fact, or grows out of a quest to understand meaning, purpose of, of, of life, the, um, how one deals with, with finitude, then maybe the concept of SPAR isn't doing the work that it should be doing. And I did think that, um, I do think that all of us who do empirical work uh, have to deal a little bit with how you do empirical research that doesn't hollow out 
the concepts and the nuances um, of religion and spirituality and make them seem a bit um, thin and pallid. Occasionally, um, I had the thought that, um, that when genetic science and medicine is the overarching rubric, the paradigm forces a kind of condescension by placing the spiritual and, and religious concerns beneath the rubric, the higher good of, does, is this good for medicine, is this good for the patient, or is it bad for the patient? Uh, which is, I think, a very different way of looking at things. But what I found most satisfying about these empirical talks is that they were very experienced near. They were real people there. Um, Larry Churchill, I'm sorry to keep quoting you, uh, said once more, spar, and I, I can't get rid of the air quotes. I don't know, maybe someday, but um, spar is always local. It is instantiated in particular practices and beliefs, and that's what the empirical data did, looked at particular practices and beliefs. So these empirical studies have the access and approach to make um, religion and spirituality feel real in all its nuance because it's actual people who are living these lives and having these problems. So where can we go from here? And I think there are two things. And um, um, I, the gloomy prospect is sort of a straw man, but it feels even more straw this morning after the talks. But so the gloomy prospect is these are two competing paradigms. It, it, they're really a conflict of religion. There's science as a religion that's providing its own consistent and closed answers to the basic questions of purpose, meaning, et cetera. Um, and through the subcategory of medical science, health would then logically be seen as a source of salvation, and good health is an indication of a state of grace. I think that there's been a fair amount written by pe people like Peter Conrad, among many others, that suggest that that's sort of where we are in the United States, and to some extent the some of the things that Mary was talking about about the last eight years, not that I can possibly blame George Bush on medicalization, but um, you know, that, that there's some resistance to that, to the, the unnamedness of science as a complete religious view that shuts out others. Um, if that's true, then one would thus expect that theologians and religious philosophers um, uh, wouldn't be able to work equitably, equitably with social scientists who were raised in their own faith because there is, in fact, this conflict. Um, but, I, you know, so that's possible, and, I, and, I, and I'd, I'd actually like to know what people think. But let, let's, for the moment, um, ignore the gloomy prospect and, and wonder how we can move forward anyway. And I think we can do that by assuming, at least for those of us who bothered to be in this room and come to this conference, and I think, again, that was shown very much throughout the conference and sort of summed up this morning, um, let's assume that that issue is not one of a conflict of faiths, but more a lack of sufficient contact and knowledge with the other perspectives. So I think that one of the things that empirical scientists um, need to realize, I mean, what struck me over and over again yesterday, was how, how much I need to learn about the nuance and differences among theological traditions if I'm going to think about that in a constructive way in empirical work. And it's really not that different from the way as somebody trained in cultural anthropology, I had to learn a whole lot about um, the nuance of genetics and genetic science before I could stand up in a room and not make an idiot of myself. Hopefully, I don't as much, um, or know how to frame questions in a, in a survey or an interview that asked, um, asked about things. Um, and I think that, that conversely, um, there has to be an acknowledgement that those um, with knowledge in, in theology and, and philosophy, but with less knowledge about clinical medicine, can also learn about the way geneticists act, genetics actually comes into play in the clinic. Um, and that by doing so, I mean that that's sort of a way to move forward. Um, so from, from all of this, I, I heard a, a, some things that, so, uh, that I heard some things that I think are methodological lessons that empirical scientists need to learn, and some of them I just mentioned, which was the sharing of, of information. Um, but I think that we also heard about religion residing in the intuition and the gut. I don't remember who said that, but it, it, it struck me as very right. And therefore, it may not be transparent to individuals. Religious thinking may be difficult to articulate and may be mixed in with many other factors to form a whole and complex belief system that makes it challenging to ask about. 
Um, I think one answer to that, and um, Gail talked to this yesterday, is that we need to ask and probe more deeply during data collection. What do, what do, you know, why did you say that? What do you mean by that? And, um, and I think we need to ask why did you make that decision rather perhaps than did religion influence your decision because I'm not sure people are going to know that. We, we you know, as the empirical scientists then need to sort out the answer during, during data analysis and hopefully in what we're working towards here, we can do that guided by a deeper understanding of religious issues and questions, which our colleagues who are not empirical scientists but have all this other knowledge and information can help us with. Um, so I think the challenges we face um, are to move past seeing religion merely as another val uh, variable, to face the issue of science as a possible religion and see where that resistance is leading us, and to be willing to seem kind of dumb to each other while we're engaging in these conversations. Um, and, and I think there has been a great deal of that kind of openness and spirit um, today. So, um, et cetera, I think goes, Ellen is going to do et cetera, um, which will be a brilliant et cetera flourish because Ellen is Ellen. And, um, and thank you all of you for letting me participate and play in your sandbox. No, I will say this really is tough, following up Nancy's comments. Um, so I'm just going to say a few things before we open this up to discussion. And I start from the notion that what drives our conversation today is that genetics in the clinic is a profoundly human enterprise. And I start from the premise that when one talks about something that's medically indicated, it's always science plus humanity. Always science plus ethics plus social, et cetera. And so I think that that actually defines the way forward for us. Um, we certainly genetics is important because it does give us a different lens. It is a different way of looking at the human condition. And for that reason, it provides particular challenges. But they are not challenges that are utterly unique in the course of human history. They're just different. Um, and I think that, as we have found in our empirical work, that among the things that come into the discussion are notions of religion and spirituality broadly written. And I think that one of the great contributions that we have seen here today is the um, explication by Larry starting out um, early on about the breadth of the discussion and then thinking about those experiences from a more explicitly theological doctrinal lens as well. Realizing that that, although it is very important, does not define the range, the whole range of the, of the human experience. What I think this says to us is this, that th these concerns are enormously important as people confront the enormous amount of information that, or the enormous amount of information that is going to be conveyed by genetics and genomics in the near future. It's going to be a lot, and we're going to have to deal with it. It is going to raise religious and spiritual concerns for many, many people. Very few of us live without at least some of that anchoring. Um, and I think the thing that this calls us to do is to think critically, as Nancy and others have already told us, to think about how we are going to study this as an empirical matter, um, how we are going to interpret these, um, and we will bring to bear in this many of the theological frames that we've already heard, um, and there will be many other the the theological, religious, and spiritual frames that we have only begun to touch on here. Um, and then we are going to think about how we bring that to bear in the clinical context. And it is going to require us specifically to say that this is part of what dealing with genetics is about. And and I think one of the reasons that we wanted to focus on the clinical context is that we were sure that these, that these issues were right out there. And if we just began to look, we would find them everywhere we turned. And sure enough, we did. 
And I think that actually beginning with the clinical context is going to provide us with the framework to begin to think about the broader implications of genomics that exist outside the clinical context, that go, as Gail challenged us to think about yesterday, to think about religion and spirituality um, and notion, as notions of meaning as notions of responsibility, or as they bear on notions of resilience, meaning, responsibility, which are going to be some of the broader issues that genetics is going to raise for us. So I think, I mean, this is certainly, you know, this conference has just exceeded my wildest dreams um, in terms of the richness of the discussion, um, helping us, I actually think, to move more explicitly to an understanding both of what an audacious project this is to think about the intersections of um, the spiritual and religious implications of genetic information as they affect, um, as they affect providers and patients. And I want to make one other observation before I close, and that, that history matters. There's a reason why we asked Ruth to start this conference. Um, and, and, and I think that's really important. We bring history with us, both individually and um, socially. Um, I think another part of our history, which was alluded to today, that is enormously important, is that we have, in the United States, a particular history about the role of religion and spirituality in our culture, and, and we need to attend to that, because that that has changed dramatically in my lifetime. And I think that we need to attend to that um, as we go forward with this process. But I, I have to say that I'm, I'm encouraged. I mean, I think this is really hard. Um, and I think that, you know, you know we're, we've just barely started. On the other hand, I'm really encouraged that we've made some progress here today and that there are really ways going forward to say this is important, we need to discuss it, there are frames we can bring to interpret it, there are other frames that we need to bring that we haven't brought yet, um, and there are really important empirical and methodologic questions that we need to ask. But I think this is, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> Just a, we've got a few more minutes for just comments about uh, the conference, where do we go from here, uh, questions that were explored that need further explorations, questions that weren't asked, that, so that, that sort of thing. Thanks. Um, one of the things that I have been thinking about through this conference is that um, if I, I need to pick one different thing of uh, genetic medicine from the ordinary medicine is family shares the same gene. So it's not just individualistic, but more like, could be, I, I wouldn't say collective, but it's it, the, the family share the same condition sometimes in, in the genetics medicine. And I think, you, um, I, as I see, a lot of data was on like collected from individuals mainly, but um, religion or spirituality could be shared by family members, for instance. It could be in a, if you go to, let's say, my country like Japan or a little community where they belong to one religious group, then the, the values could be really collective. So I think I, I would like to see if it's possible in the future, I would like to see not only individualistic, as, individualistic aspect, but also the collective as, aspect to see, you know, what's going to happen between religion, spirituality, and, and genetic medicine. I actually want to thank you for that comment um, for any number of reasons, but one of which is that that I actually think that our current focus on autonomy in this culture and sort of the individualistic notion about how we live our lives is actually, well, it's historically weird. Um, and actually, I think it's probably, 
I actually think it's probably personally weird because almost all of us live in relationship. I mean, of some sort or other, and actually usually multiple. And I think that understanding humans as social people, as social beings who are tied by relationships of love, blood, but also relation, all other kinds of relationships as well, actually suggests that you know, that the unit of inquiry should be more than the individual. So I actually thank you very much for that comment because I think you're right on target. Um, I also um, was thinking a lot in, in response to Nancy's talk. Um, I really, really like this idea of, of science as another religion. And the word that kept coming to my mind as you were speaking is dogma. And you know, that I am sort of as troubled by dogmatic scientists as I am, you know, dogmatic, you know, conservative religious people. Um, and that th there may be a frame that has to do with, with dogma, sort of pe people who are dogmatic about whatever it is they believe and people who are less dogmatic about whatever it is they believe. And the conversation may be easier to start with less dogmatic people on both sides. I'll follow up on that. Uh, what I wanted, one thing I take away from this conference is what I got from the discussions on the fluidity of religion and spirituality. And I just want to make the point that, um, that was, came out, but I'm not sure overtly, is that genetics is, is so fluid and, and will continue to change so much. And so, what I see is important, what's so important is the discussion and the conversation, and um, what's less important is to think we'll get to an answer. Um, Gail, I'll say one reason that I wanted to focus on the clinic first is that it's harder to be dogmatic in, dogmatic in the clinic than it is in the lab. I want to say first that I thought this was a very interesting and provocative conference. Um, I would be very interested in a further exploration of the obligation we had, you brought up the topic of families, but uh, the obligations, the ethical obligations of family members to share genetic information. I think that's a topic that different religions may have different perspectives on, and I think that that's worth exploring. Uh, just, a, uh, just a brief comment, uh, since we're talking about religion, most of the time we've, we've been talking about Christianity and Judaism. Um, and as there are many people know, that since 1965 and the liberalization of the Immigration Act, our country is the most religiously diverse in the country, in the world. And uh, that's, uh, I guess, something to be... Uh, thought about and saluted, but it's also something to think about with great care, and that as you, to the extent that you continue this enterprise to look at religion that's more representative of the important things that are happening in our country, there's some real challenges there and real advantages. Um, um, people look at this in a lot of ways. Uh, some of us think that, uh, look at it in terms of social capital when we as a country have different cultures and religion coming to us, it is a great opportunity. Um, and uh, while religion can divide, uh, it can also cohere. Uh, and I think um, a lot of thought will be, need to be given in the future about religious diversity and how you factor that in to the way that you see this enterprise uh, developing in our country. Thank you. My name is Parvin, and I want to thank for all the coordinating this beautiful conference. It has been very educational. It would have been more valuable if you could have invited people from other religions so we could have learned about their opinions and how they perceive uh, genetic uh, counseling. And uh, uh, I would like to 
uh, see that next time in your conferences you bring people from different religions and cultures. Thank you. Um, needless to say, that's what we plan. You have to start somewhere, and this is where we started. But, but you're absolutely right. And um, we are mindful of uh, the fact that this is not as, as inclusive as we would like. But yeah, I was just going to thank both of you who made those comments, and, and clearly that's true. I mean, the, the, the diversity of re religious perspectives um, hasn't, um, it hasn't been here as fully, but, and I also just wanted to echo Ellen's statement um, about the importance of a historical perspective and seeing a lot of what's, what's going on in terms of historical perspective and that, that starting with Ruth, I hadn't even thought of that was a, you know, a very prescient thing to do. And we've all worked really hard, haven't we? This has been very intense. So I think Ellen should give, and Joe should give the audience a hand, too. Yes, I, I think we'll um, close questions there. And thank you, uh, Nancy Press and Ellen Clayton, for helping us wrap things up. I do want to thank all of the presenters and all of the participants for an incredible conference. Um, and I want to just mention two specific where to go from here items. Um, one is that we are going to have this published in the American Journal of Medical Genetics um, in January of 2009. Uh, so some of you have asked for papers and that sort of thing. So there, there will be that forthcoming, uh, just so you know that. Also, uh, I will send an email to everyone who's registered for the conference um, with other people's information, their emails, so that those who have shared this experience can uh, use this as a springboard to, you know, collaborate and discuss things. And I'll, I, and I'll also send you an email asking, people have been interested in what, who's in here and what their professions are. Um, and I'll, I'm going to actually ask you to reply back to me so that I can get that information and make that part of the inf you know, information for each participant. If you don't want to you know, disclose that information, that's fine. But, um, uh, but anyway, I just wanted to mention that that is also forthcoming. And again, thank you for being here and thank all of you for, uh, for thinking really hard and asking really good questions. And thanks to Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.